Hey TC family, it's Pastor Alex and I'm here with you online and I can't wait to share with you this message that's in my heart. You know, I've been thinking about this message honestly for about eight months now and I just didn't have the words to say it. Do you ever have something that's like really like pumping in your heart but you don't know how to say what you wanna say so you don't say anything at all? Oftentimes that's not me. I usually uh, articulate half-baked thoughts and feelings. Um, my wife is really good at that. We're not saying anything until she is sure. Um, but this time I've actually taken time, energy, and emotion to really try to clarify my thoughts for you. Because TC, if I could speak to you as a church right now, it's absolutely critical that you and I are on the same page with the following message. I would even say that if we aren't on the same page, it could be detrimental to your faith journey. Because these aren't my thoughts. These aren't something that, you know, we came together as a team and said, what, what can we tell the church or teach the church this week? But this is what we know is true about the Holy Spirit inspired scripture for God's people. And guess what? If you're watching, you're God's people. You know, I was just looking back over the last three years, a lot of that was pandemic. Some of us in different places in the world, it's still pandemic. And I was just thinking about the changes that happened in those three years. Because before pandemic, life was full and it was busy and the expectations were high. The expectations were high. You always have some, you know, your kids need something, your friends need something, your boss needs something, your partners, your employees, like everybody is just busy with expectation. And your whole life is kind of filled with the expectation of other people. And you, in that position, are called and required to then try to meet the expectations of other people. And really, that's what life is all about. There's a famous guy named Henry Cloud, genius when it comes to boundaries. He says that real integrity is the ability to fulfill the expectations of reality, which means that it's not your world and only your thoughts, perspective, and feelings that matter, but then you also have to fulfill these expectations of reality, what it means to be a functioning member of society, family, or organization. And that's what integrity is all about. But then something interesting happened. All of the sudden, expectations shifted. See, during pandemic, we started to struggle with feelings of fear, doubt, concern, anxiety, and stress. People stopped expecting from one another, and a lot of expectations and thoughts turned inward. Oh my gosh, what should I do? What can I do? What am I going to do? What if I get sick? What if my family gets sick? Financially, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to my business? How could I change my business? How could I responsibly care for this and move this forward? What about my staff? What about my employees? What about my boss? What about my partners? See, all of a sudden, we begin to put a lot of expectations on ourselves. We became extremely dependent upon our own ability to manage the season during the pandemic. We also became very comfortable. What we're gonna do during our day, how we're gonna keep our sanity, what are we gonna eat? Are we gonna work out? Are we gonna stay healthy? Do we just let ourselves go and put on sweatpants? Things changed during the pandemic. And for a season, we started practicing a behavior that is more self-focused. And we got used to it. We built habits around it, where we became less interdependent. We stopped expecting others in our communities, in our faith realms, spheres, in our organizations. And we carried a lot of the weight and the responsibility on our own shoulders. And things became a lot more about us. And now something else is happening. We're all transitioning out of this pandemic where we're being reminded that maybe Things aren't just about us anymore. You know, this is something critical to our faith because the very essence of our faith in Christ means that we have decided that we are stepping up to live a life that is bigger than us. 
I want to read to you from Hebrews because the Hebrew people oftentimes had issues with being self-centered. When we look at the old covenant of God, the biggest issue is that God's people had, that Israel had, is they were always making all of God's favor and blessing and commitment about them. Instead of being a light to the world, they wanted to be a light to themselves. Instead of taking the favor and grace that God showed them and showing it to their neighbors or the foreigners, they just allowed it to kind of make them feel like, well, we're the favorite. We can do anything we want. God loves us no matter what, you know? And his love and his care and his favor actually had an adverse effect on us because the corruption that sometimes lives in our hearts is selfish attitude. And in the New Testament, there's this book called the book of Hebrews, where the leader of the New Testament church speaks to the Hebrew Christians. And I love it how much time he spends affirming that they don't have to be selfish. Why don't they have to be selfish? Why don't they have to be self-centered? Why don't they always have to think about themselves? Because Christ is thinking about them for them. I want to read to you this from 19. It says, therefore, brother, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new living way that he opened up for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over us, the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure Water. I want to stop right there. Go back to that. We're going to spend some time breaking this down. Why does this paint a picture that we don't have to be selfish anymore because Christ is selfless? Verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us. Stop right there. The writer of this book is helping us understand that it is not about our works for our salvation. If it's not about our works, it's also not about our sin. And it's more about him and what he has done and desires to do in our life. See, during pandemic, it became all about us. Our ability to manage, our ability to survive, our ability to not fail. Some of us developed intense addictions during pandemic, drinking, pornography, drugs, relationships, affairs. Some of us developed some very unhealthy habits. Some of us developed a overly enlarged sense of ego and responsibility where we thought we were the only ones carrying the weight, which led to depression, anxiety, high levels of stress, resentment. But Jesus is reminding us that for eternity and everything that eternity encompasses, it's all about his work. Since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new living way that he opened for us, he made a way for us. He made a way for us to succeed in business. He made a way for us to exceed in relationships. He made a way for us to lay down temptation and addiction. He made a way for us to have freedom because he's so centered on us. And we don't have to be centered on us in this way anymore because we know he's our provider. We know that he cares. He's our deliverer and our redeemer. Then it says, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance with faith. What does that mean? It means that you and I are not alone. Do you know that more people felt alone during the pandemic in any other season of life? Why? Because most of us were. We may have not been alone when it comes to being around family or even friends, but we were alone because none of us really knew how to process together what was happening. So instead of processing with one another or processing with God, we processed in ourselves and we didn't let people in to process with us. Some of us were actually physically alone. Some of us were alone in our houses, alone in our apartments, and we didn't actually even have the chance to share with others. But what is this scripture in 21 helping us understand? It's helping us understand in 21 and in 22 that we are never alone because Christ is our high priest. What was the role of the high priest? 
to represent God to us in fellowship and commitment. That he is mindful of us always. He's an advocate for us always. And he is there to process our failures and our successes. See, with Israel, the high priest's role was to give offerings for mistakes and offerings for victory and thanksgiving. That means that he had a role in every individual's life in the community of Israel to make sure that when they had their greatest wins, he was there. When they had their greatest failures, he was there. And he's still there with us now. But some of us lost the focus of him being there with us. And we began to feel alone. And then finally, it says, with our hearts sprinkled with clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And then in verse 23, it says, then let us hold fast to that confession of hope without wavering. Why does it say hold fast to that? Because one of the hardest things to do is to wake up every day and say to yourself, I don't have to be selfish because Christ is self." Bliss. I don't have to carry all the burden and all the weight of my life because Christ carries it with me. He cares for my body. He cares for my emotions. He cares for my family. He cares for my finances. He is always mindful of, of me, which enables me to be mindful of others. See, if there's one thing that is an absolute as you begin to journey with Jesus in the body of Christ, It's that you understand that you are part of something bigger than you. It's not just about what you can take, but it's about what you can give. It's not about how you can just be served, but it's about how you can be, how you can serve. Some of us in the body of Christ have become really comfortable and dare I say a little bit self-centered. And we no longer think about what we bring to the table. More so we think about what we gain what we can receive about what we can take. That's not family. That's not the body of Christ. In the body of Christ, Christ serves us, loves us, feeds us, and cares for us as we serve, love, feed, and care for others. I want you to look at this because immediately after, the writer helps them understand that Christ is so for them that they don't longer have to be for themselves, but they can be for others Listen to what he says in verse 24. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. I love that language, stir up one another to love and good works. The first thing I always think about, and I've said this to TC before, when you see that language stir up, it's brilliant because I love to cook. And one of my favorite things to cook is soup. And when you cook soup and you let it simmer for a long time, because that's what it takes for all the flavors to melt together, all the good stuff goes to the bottom. And before you serve it, you have to stir it up. Because during this season, my brother and my sister, for a lot of us, the good stuff has sunk to the bottom. And it's going to take you talking to another believer or hearing a message in person for those good things to be stirred up and come back to the surface. And you to remember who you are and what God has called you to. That only happens when we are stirred up. Not only do we get stirred up, but guess what? You come, you show up, you participate in community. You actually say yes to being a part of something bigger than you. And now you have the chance to stir up somebody else. To say, hey, I heard what happened to you. Remember what God has called you to. Hey, I know you're stressed and I know it's been hard, but remember who our father is. See, it's when we come together, verse 25 or verse 24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, that we encourage one another, we serve one another, and we connect with one another. Next, verse 25, it says, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. Why weren't they meeting together? You know what? There's a lot of different reasons. One of the reasons is they were afraid for their life because of the persecution in the New Testament church, not only by opposing forces and governments, but by religious zealots. And these new followers of Christ were being persecuted, some even to the point of death. So they were afraid to meet together in fear of their lives. 
They thought they could lose their life if they went to a connect group. They thought they could lose the life of their spouse or their son or their daughter or their mother or their father if they attended a corporate spiritual service because of the persecution that existed. And the writer says, even with that fear, don't stop coming together. Also, some of them had a mentality that was a little bit skewed away from the truth. See, some of them believed that it was more about the connection of just God and them versus the connection of them and each other. So they would say, I can sit on my couch and watch a sermon and I feel great about Jesus because I feel blessed in my soul. But they're missing the part about them serving and participating in the body of Christ with one another. Because remember, Jesus says that if you're my disciple, you'll be known by how you love one another. It's hard to love people from your couch. And I know some of you might be saying, you know, hey, you know what? I WhatsApp people every day to check on them. And WhatsApps are great, dude. But like, just to let you know, I've turned off all my alerts because I'm so tired of WhatsApp messages because my soul craves real connection and relationship. So you and I have to understand that it's all about us and God, but it's all about us and each other. So he says, not neglecting to meet together is a habit of some. Some of them have neglected it, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, this is something that we've observed, and I'm going to wrap this up right now because I hope this is just a challenging devotional for you. I hope this shanks you a little bit. I hope you say to yourself, man, Alex, that was really intense. You don't even know my circumstances, or you don't know what I've been going through or processing, and I may not know but God knows, and he still inspired the Holy Spirit to write this 2,000 years ago through the leader of the Hebrew church. And this is what we've observed in our body when we see the greatest health in individuals' lives. Three key elements. Could you put the Come and Connect serve up? This is what we know, is number one, the healthiest Individuals have these three things in common. Number one, they're coming, which means they show up. They're being fed, they're being nourished. They're being fed by others, encouraged by others and served by others. They're learning and growing. Oftentimes at church, you don't just learn what you wanna learn, but you learn what God has for you. And that's really important for our faith. Next they're actually connecting and they're able to process what they learn. See, they look around and they say, you know what, do you ever struggle with this? Have you ever asked yourself this question? I was listening to the sermon and I had heard all those things before and I had a hard time reconciling some of the things that Pastor Jordan said. What do I do with that? And you process and you connect with one another. You allow your body to digest the word of God so you can properly apply it to your life. And you know what the fruit of proper application of the scripture is? You know what the fruit is? There's one fruit and you're going to be like, you know, Alex, don't, that's a, that's a strong statement. I'm sorry. It's what the scripture says. There's, there's one main primary fruit of properly digesting the scripture and it's serving one another. It's your ability to serve. It's your ability to serve the love that you've received from God to others around you. And that can happen through many different ways. And you know, the church's goal, not just TC, but the local church's goal is to create opportunities for you to serve. In fact, actually, it makes it easier for you to serve because you don't have to go find someone in need two kilometers down the street from your house. You can come on Sunday and there's a, a thousand people in need that would love your service. So the church, Christ's body, facilitates your opportunity and your ability to obey the scripture and serve one another. How incredible is that? See, sometimes you have people that come, but they don't serve and they don't connect. So they become actually kind of spiritually stagnant or spiritually chubby because they're feeding but they aren't exercising what they're being fed. 
You have some people that serve, but they're not coming. And they kind of become like Martha, where they're all about what they do, what they bring to the table, but they're not allowing the Spirit to minister to them and feed them through the sermons or through the community. And then without connect, oftentimes you have people that kind of get weird in their process of the message. They start to think things like, you know, I don't know, I think I, I think I have this more figured out because they only listen to the voice inside their own head and they don't listen to the voice of anybody else because they're not really connecting in real relationship. So you could have two out of three or even one out of three and that's great, but our heart is that you would have three out of three, that you would be coming, connecting and serving and being a part of the body of Christ. It takes humility and that's tough. It takes a lack of self-centeredness and that's really hard. Above both of those, it takes faith to know that Jesus is for you so you don't have to be for yourself as much. And all of those things are tough, but I believe that that's what Christ has called us to and he's given us his spirit. And the writer of Hebrews wraps it up like this. Go back to the last scripture, please. In Hebrews 10, 26, as he wraps up this little section of scripture, he says, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for our sin. What does this mean? What does this mean? That sounds really heavy, right? What's the sin that he's talking about? He's talking about the sin, which is missing the mark or not following the instruction given, right? That he just dictated. What's the instruction that he just dictated? is when you know Jesus is for you, with you, protecting you, loving you, and caring for you, then you're able to actually love and care for and serve other people. But if Jesus isn't enough to make you feel safe and secure, if Jesus isn't enough to help you step outside of your comfort and serve others and not stay on the couch, if he's not enough to get you to do that, then nobody's enough. And that's what it means when it says, for if we continue our way, if we continue on sinning deliberately, if we continue pretending that Jesus isn't enough for us to selflessly love and serve other people, then who would ever be enough? There remains no other sacrifice. Nobody else is going to give their life for us. No one else is going to transcend from heaven to earth to show us the way. If he's not enough, nothing is ever enough. So church... Let's make Jesus enough. Let's make Jesus enough, what he has done enough, and his love for us enough, where we understand that we have a greater calling so much bigger than us. Father, I just thank you so much for this message, for your heart for us, and that you are enough. This isn't about suffering. This isn't about hardship. This isn't about us having to sacrifice, but it's about a shift in our minds that we would understand the weight and the value that you bring to the table when you sacrificed for us. The fact that you care for us, the fact that you love us, and the fact we don't have to live in fear and in doubt, but we can actually look to you as someone who will really work for us in every situation. We thank you so much in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So TC family, we love you so much. Don't forget that we want to see you coming, connecting, and serving. We want to see you participating in community and not journeying your faith alone. We want to see you growing and maturing spiritually. And we want to see your gifts because what you bring to the table matters. So please take your next steps today. Don't just walk away the same, but walk away different because what the Holy Spirit has called you to do. We love you so much. See you next week.